In this video, I want to demonstrate the technique of proof by smallest counterexample. Now, before we do that, I should actually mention very briefly, what does one mean by proof by counterexample at all? Um, we'll do some more about, we'll do some more examples of that, about this type of proof technique later on in our lecture series, proof by counterexample. Um, but let me briefly introduce it so that we can talk about least counterexample. So what, after all, what, what is a counterexample? A counterexample is an example which demonstrates that a universal statement is in fact false. Now, I hope the statement I have on the screen hasn't bothered anyone because I should mention that this statement is grossly an incorrect statement. So sometimes people will say this and it's a horrible thing to say, but I'm actually gonna prove right now, you know, forever afterward, this is a false statement that women are bad at mathematics. This is a universal statement as it's stated. You're, you're saying that the set of all women uh, is a subset of those who are bad at mathematics. Now I should mention that, how do we know that the statement is false? Now, some people might be like, well, some women are bad at math. Like I had this math teacher once, she was a girl and she was horrendous at mathematics. She was bad at math. Well, okay, so providing evidence that there are some women who are bad at mathematics does not say that all women are bad at mathematics. Um, and also, so that doesn't disprove the statement. Um, you might also be like, well, I've known men who are bad at mathematics. Uh, maybe you could list a lot of men who've been bad at mathematics. Again, it's like, well, that doesn't say anything about this statement. Um, in order to show that this statement is false, because again, it's saying that all women are bad at mathematics, what you have to do is provide a counterexample. All you have to do is provide to, to, to the person who stated this, one woman who was good at mathematics, and then that would disprove this statement. Okay, and honestly, there are countless, countlessly many women throughout history, especially in the modern era, who are very, very capable mathematicians. Um, I want to highlight just a very few of them really quickly here. Um, so Hypatia is a sort of a very important one to notice because from the sort of modern historical era, uh, she is one of the first well-known women mathematicians. Uh, so let's see, she was alive, oh boy, I'm gonna mess this up, around like 400 AD, maybe 600 AD. I might, I, I, I might botch this a little bit, but she was involved, of course, in like the school, the Greek school in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, for which she wrote about mathematics and philosophy, a very, very brilliant mind. Uh, but of course, historically, a lot of women were not allowed to participate in scholarly efforts. Uh, she, of course, was a notable exception and one of the first that we know much about. I mean, like we know uh, there's historical records about her life and she was a brilliant mathematician and definitely a counterexample to this horrible statement right here. She was a good mathematician and I can list so many other mathematicians as well. I'm not going to spend all the time listing all of them, but some of my favorites, of course, uh, would be Sophie Germain um, because of her contributions to number theory. I've used like Sophie Germain primes uh, are named after her, which is something that showed up in my own uh, research before. Um, Amy Noether, uh, a famous uh, Jewish woman mathematician from Germany um, who basically had to teach at the university for free uh, because she was unable as a woman to hold a position at the, at the institution. But all of her colleagues were like, she's one of the most brilliant mathematicians we've ever known. Please hire her. And it took forever for her to actually get any, res any, any reasonable position and such. But um, uh, also because it's the fact that she was a woman also because I'm pretty sure she was Jewish as well. Um, and Germany close to World War II led to some problems. So that's, she eventually had, a, had to leave, but she had brilliant work, particularly in abstract algebra. Also a topic that very much is close to my heart. The idea of a no theory and ring is named after her. Um, I mean, some other fun examples to mention, you could take Dorothy Vaughn or Katherine Johnson who were made famous in the movie Hidden Figures. Uh, for the work they did as uh, black women mathematicians working for NASA, uh, sort of during the civil rights era and such. And again, these are just a few examples. I could live so many more, Ada Lovelace, um, Julia Robinson. And honestly, I think a lot of the people watching this video right now are probably, I mean, I don't know who's watching it, but I'm quite certain there are many women watching this video who are quite capable of mathematics, which is why they're watching this video right now. These are all examples of counterexamples uh, to disprove this statement right here. So I, I don't wanna hear anyone ever say that ever again. Um, anybody can be good at mathematics. Your race, gender, whatever, none of these things matter. All that matters is that you have uh, 
a heart and a mind for mathematics. You have a love for mathematics and you have the fortitude to study. Those are the qualities that make a good mathematician. Their grit, their um, their 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 intelligence, their their hard work. These 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 are the attributes which make someone a good mathematician. Okay, and so I, I mentioned this as an example of proof by counterexample. I know this statement is false because I can provide counterexamples. Now, in this statement, I can provide tons of counterexamples, but of course, only takes one to disprove a universal statement. Now, with that in mind, let's pivot to the notion of proof by least counterexample. Uh, this is a technique that basically utilizes the well ordering principle that we've talked about before. Um, for which I should mention the well-ordering principle is related to this idea of mathematical induction. And we'll actually, in this video, uh, solidify the connection between the well-ordering principle and uh, the principle of mathematical induction. But we'll do that in just a second. The well-ordering principle tells us that if I take any non-empty subset of natural numbers, it contains a minimum element. Okay. But we've also learned, we've also learned uh, this technique which we call proof by contradiction. Okay. So a proof by contradiction means that in order to prove a statement to be true, you can assume that it's false and then derive a contradiction. And so when you combine these two proof techniques together, because we've seen some proofs where you use the minimal natural number to satisfy a condition, like we proved, for example, that, um, that the division algorithm follows by the well-ordering principle, Euclidean algorithm follows by the well-ordering principle. We've done some big proofs using the well-ordering principle. If you combine the well-ordering principle but with proof by contradiction, you then get this technique which is referred to as proof by least counterexample. And so what this is is the following. Imagine you have a statement that you believe to be true um, about integers or natural numbers or something. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to prove it by contradiction. I'm going to suppose that it's not true. Now, because you have this sequence of statements involving uh, natural numbers, or at least they're indexed by natural numbers, um, if it, and this is a universal statement, it's, you're saying it's true for all natural numbers, um, if it's false by your assumption, then there has to be counterexamples to the statement, like we talked about on the previous slide. And if there's counterexamples, since the counterexamples are indexed by natural numbers, by the well-ordering principle, there has to be a smallest or a least counterexample. And so then you look at that least counterexample and then argue that it can't be the smallest. That if it was a counterexample, there actually was a smaller one contradicting the well-ordering principle and then giving you the contradiction you're looking for. So in summary, um, to prove to prove something true, a universal statement about integers or natural numbers, you assume it to be false. You then use the well-ordering principle to find a smallest counterexample. And then you argue that there's actually JK, a smaller counterexample than the one you're given by the well-ordering principle, giving you the contradiction. So that's the basic template of that proof pattern. Let's take a theorem that we've already proven before um, and prove it using this method of least counterexample. Let n be a positive integer. Prove that the sum of the first n odd integers is in fact equal to n squared. So one plus three plus five plus seven, all the way up to two n minus one is equal to n squared. We proved this previously using combinatorial proof, uh, but it turns out we can also prove this in lots of different ways. We can prove this using uh, this method of smallest counterexample. And so I'm gonna provide a proof of that right now. And so sure enough, we're going to prove this using smallest counterexample. Suppose to the contrary that the above equation is false. That is, there exists some positive integers for which this doesn't hold. Well, the S of all counterexamples um, to this equation is a set of natural numbers. That is to say, like, oh, if it doesn't work for 17, 17's inside the set. If it doesn't work for 39, 39's in the set. If it doesn't work for uh, 11, 11's in the set. This is a subset of natural numbers, and since the statement is false universally, uh, that is to say there does exist a counterexample, we know this is a non-empty set of natural numbers by the well-ordering principle. There's a smallest counterexample. Call that counterexample k. What that means is the equation 1 plus 3 plus 5 up to k, 2k minus 1 does not equal, that expression does not equal k squared. This doesn't hold in the case for k. That's what it means to be a counterexample. It's like, okay, well, note... I know that k is not equal to 1 because the left-hand side, when, when k equals 1, would just equal 1 itself. The right-hand side would be 1 squared, which 1 does equal 1 squared. So the equation does hold for k equals 1. So k can't be equal to 1, all right? Uh, now, 
Let's take the number immediately in front of k. The reason I have, the reason I have to rule out one here is because this is a statement I'm trying to make about positive integers. If k was the smallest counterexample, then that means the number less than it, zero, is not a positive integer. So I don't I'm not making any statement about that right now. So I did want to remove one from possibility here. So let's look at k minus one. I know k minus one is a positive number. It's a natural number smaller than k, a positive integer smaller than k. Since since k was the smallest counterexample. Example, that means if I apply this formula to k minus 1, it will hold. 1 plus 3 plus 5 all the way up to 2k minus 1 minus 1 is equal to k minus 1 squared. Okay, so this equation does hold. Now, if I were to add to both sides of the equation 2k minus 1, let's see what happens. On the right-hand side, you're going to get a sum of, num a sum of, sum of odd numbers, 1 plus 3 plus 5 up to and uh, finishing with this, of course, this uh, 2k minus 1, like so. Uh, what about the right-hand side? On the right-hand side, you get, if you FOIL that thing out, the k minus 1 squared, you get k squared minus 2k plus 1. Um, you're also adding to it the 2k minus 1 from before. Um, with that, we'll simplify on the right-hand side just to be a k squared. So I want to kind of show you what we have there um, on the... On the left-hand side, I think I highlighted too much earlier. Sorry about that. On the left-hand side, you have 1 plus 3 plus 5 all the way up to 2k minus 1. Then if you take the k minus 1 squared plus the 2k minus 1, you, that'll simplify just to be k squared. Notice this now says that 1 plus 3 up to 2k minus 1 is equal to k squared, which it doesn't equal that. It violates the fact that k was, in fact, a counterexample. It's not the smallest counterexample. We get a contradiction. And since we get a contradiction, this actually implies that the original statement was true, that it, the, the equation holds for all, um, for all natural numbers, for all positive integers in that situation. Now, when you look at this proof, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. When you look at this proof, in many ways, it has the structure of an of a, um, induction argument. Like, I did consider a base case. Right? I, I considered it for a different reason, but I did consider this base case. Um, I also like looked at the case where I'm before the number I'm considering, and using the fact that it's true, I'm able to imply that the next case was actually true, for which that gives us a contradiction, hence given that this wasn't the smallest counterexample, but in many ways it has the same flavor. It's like, it's like a base case right here, an inductive hypothesis, the inductive step. Um, this, this argument could very well be rewritten to become a principle, uh, an argument by the principle of induction. Uh, this very much feels like a weak induction argument right here. Weak as opposed to not the strong induction argument. Um, but I should mention, like I've mentioned this a couple times already in this lecture series, that the methods of induction, which we've already argued that the first and second principles of induction are actually the same thing. Um, induction is actually logically equivalent to the well-ordering principle. And I do want to say a little bit of why that is right now. Now, to see that, in, to see why induction implies the well-ordering principle, um, what we can do is we can use induction on the cardinality of sets, which are subsets of the natural numbers. Okay, uh, positive subsets of the natural numbers there. Uh, and you can take unions to take care of infinite sets and such. I'm not going to go through all the details of it right here, but basically you play, you play around with cardinalities of these subsets. So like if you take a singleton, uh, clearly it has a, it has a minimal element because there's only one element in there. Um, so then you're like, okay, then you, then you have an inductive hypothesis. If S is cardinality is equal to K, then it has a minimum. Um, in which case then you look at, look at a set like a set whose cardinality is K plus one. Well, if it's cardinality is K plus one, then basically S can be broken up into a, uh, a single element. So we'll call that A. And then you have this other set, S take away A, like so. Notice that this set now has cardinality K, so by our inductive hypothesis, it has a minimum element B. And so then, then you have to look at the minimum of S is going to equal, the minimum of S is then it can equal the minimum of A and B, which is gonna be one or the other, um, depending on what A is less than or B, or less than or greater than B, you know, whatever, you, you figure that out. And so that set then has a minimum element. And so then by induction, um, you then can carry this on. And so every finite subset of natural numbers has a minimum element in that regard. Um, you can then of course deal with unions. Again, there's some more details I'm skipping over here, but how do you deal with infinite subsets of the natural numbers? Um, 
you 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 can you can play around with those things. Don't worry about it. I'm not going through all the details of that. That gives you like one direction. That's the basics of the one direction, even with some some things missing. For the other direction, how do you prove that the well ordering principle implies induction? Well, induction is a conditional statement. If the base case holds, so you have like some s of zero here, and um, you have to also have the conditional that s k implies s k plus one, then those put together are supposed to imply that for all natural numbers, S of N holds. So that's what the induction is, a conditional statement. You can prove it by direct proof. So you assume this to be true, um, and then you have to argue that this is true. And again, you basically prove it by least counterexample. So if this statement is false, because after all, it's a universal statement, if that statement's false, then by the well ordering principle, which we're assuming to be true right now, there has to be a least counterexample. You take that counterexample, which let's say it happens at the k plus one spot. Well, so s of k plus one is false, but since it's the least counterexample, you get that s of k is actually true. And then by your inductive hypothesis, which we're assuming to be true as part of the direct proof, this actually shows that s of k plus one is actually true, gives us contradiction. And therefore, since we negated the statement, it actually was true. So this actually shows us, again, without giving all the details here, this is the basic argument why induction, the principle of induction, the principle of well, the well ordering principle are actually logically equivalent to each other. Anything you can prove with induction, you can pr prove by least counterexample. Anything you can prove by least counterexample, you can prove by induction. Anything you can prove by strong induction, you can prove by weak induction. Everything you can prove by weak induction, you can prove by strong induction. They're logically the same tool. Now, which tool do you use? That honestly comes down to your personal style, right? You have to decide as an author, do you think the well ordering principle would be a more clear argument than induction or vice versa? What would lead to a better composition? Logically, correctness, it doesn't make a difference. Those three methods, the first principle of induction, second principle of induction, well ordering principle, these least counter examples, they all give you the same thing. So I don't want you to fret too much about which one should you use. Do which one you think sounds better. What makes it clearer to the reader that you're writing for? That is the decision you make. What leads to a simpler argument, a clearer argument, which often has to do with shorter arguments here. Honestly, with this proof right here, I don't think least counter example is the clearest argument. I provided it, but I think an induction argument would be much better. No, don't get me wrong. I think combinatorial proof would be the very best method for this proof, which we did earlier. Uh, but the method of combinatorial proof actually is a different logically a logical structure. Um, these ones, of course, are the same argument. So if I had to choose between um, weak induction, strong induction, or the or a least counterexample, I think this proof, uh, this identity, would be best done with a weak induction argument. You don't need any of the predecessors except for the immediate predecessor. So hence, you don't need strong induction here. Only the one assumption is necessary. And then honestly, this, this least counterexample argument led to what honestly feels like an induction argument. I feel like it could be simplified with induction. But these are all statements about style, about composition, about clarity. Um, which technique you choose will be based upon which makes the argument the best for the reader. And don't let anyone else tell you any other reason. Choose the method based upon what will benefit the reader the most, what will simplify the proof the best. So with that said, we're now ready to prove our climactic theorem with regard to our discussion of integers in the last couple lectures. I wanna prove the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And I'm actually choosing to prove this theorem uh, using this method of least counterexample. Um, I actually do think that while we could use induction, I actually think least counterexample in this situation does lead to a simpler argument than induction in this situation. Uh, if you disagree with me, that's perfectly fine. I have no concern with that. They are logically the same. It comes down to a matter of style, like we just said. And of course, this is an opinion. This can differ between um, experts, in, you know, artists in the same in the same discipline. No issue with that. So what is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? The adjective fundamental is attached to theorems only in rare situations, you know, like the fundamental theorem of calculus, the fundamental theorem of algebra. It usually is a big deal when you talk about the fundamental theorem. So the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, arithmetic basically is a synonym here for number theory, um, the, st the theory of numbers, particularly natural numbers and integers. And so the fundamental theorem of arithmetic is basically telling you this is one of the most important results about integers or natural numbers. And so what this tells us is that if n is an integer greater than 1, so it has to be a positive integer, then 
Um, there exists primes, P1, P2, up to PR, where R is a natural number here, such that N equals the product P1, P2 times P3 times P4 up to P to the R. And it's not necessarily the case that these primes are different. You can't have a repeated prime. Like, for example, 12, its prime factorization would be 2 times 2 times 3. You can repeat a factor. That's not a big deal whatsoever. So the fundamental theorem of arithmetic tells us that every integer has a prime divisor. Uh, excuse me, that's a, we already proved that. It has a prime factorization. Furthermore, this factorization is unique. That is, if we have a second prime factorization, n equals q1 times 2, q2 up to q3, up to qs, right? Then it turns out that the number of primes in play here are the same. q and s are the same thing. And each of the qis actually corresponds to the pis um, up, to re, up to reordering them, right? They might be in the wrong order. Like, for example, 12, you can factor it as 2 times 2 times 3. You can factor it as 2 times 3 times 2. You can factor it as 3 times 2 times 2. Those are all considered the same prime factorization because you're just using the same primes, just in a different order. You can't factor a positive integer doing different primes. Um, you can also generalize this to like uh, negative primes as well because uh, you, you can you can have negative primes and negative integers in that situation. Um, I'm not going to worry about that in this situation. We'll take just just it for positive integers. You know, take a course in number theory if you want to see more about this stuff. Uh, I just want to prove this fundamental theorem of arithmetic using, of course, this method of least counterexample. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to suppose, notice there's actually two statements. I should make mention of that. There's two statements here. There's a so-called existence statement that the first statement is that there is a prime factorization. And then there is a uniqueness statement. All right. In our next unit, we're going to talk some more about existence versus uniqueness. Um, we'll, do, we'll develop a lot more about that. But I, what I can say for right now is that with these things, you have to prove two things. You have to prove that it exists, the prime factorization, and there's not a second one. Okay, uniqueness. And I'm going to prove both of those by contradiction using least counterexamples. Okay, so we're going to deal with existence first. We always should start with existence first. So suppose to the contrary that there exists a positive integer without a prime factorization. So this says that all positive integers other than one have a prime factorization. Well, suppose there's not one to the contrary. Well, then by the well ordering principle, there has to be a least positive integer who has no prime factorization. Call that number n. Now, previously shown in this lecture series, um, we proved that every number has a prime divisor. This was an example of where we proved a number. Uh, we, we used the strong induction principle here. We proved that every, uh, every divisor, every integer greater than 1, has a prime divisor. We'll call that prime divisor P1. Therefore, n equals P1 times m. Okay. Now, because these are positive integers and p is a prime number, so it's at least two, if not bigger, the other divisor m has to be smaller than n. Okay. Now, since n was the smallest number without a prime divisor, a prime, uh, excuse me, a prime factorization, it does have a prime divisor, then that means m has a prime factorization because it's smaller than n. n was the least counterexample. And so then if we substitute that n, for m, we then get that n equals p1 times p2 times p3 up to pr, and this is then a prime factorization of n. This gives us a contradiction. So this shows us that every positive integer greater than 1 has a prime factorization. I did this with least counterexample, but you also could do this using a strong induction argument. You can modify it very quickly if you prefer to do it that way, because after all, use the theorem, which we proved using strong induction. That gives us that every number has a prime divisor. And then by your strong inductive hypothesis, since m is smaller, it has a prime factorization, you get that. So if you want to avoid least counterexample, that is, you want to avoid a proof by contradiction, you could do that. Uh, but it's not really fundamentally different than what we have right here. I want to illustrate this proof by least counterexample. But we could have done it very easily by strong induction as well. Now, that only gives us the first half of the statement. The second half is we have to show that this factorization is unique. So suppose... And so like that first argument works really well with, um, it worked okay with proof by least counterexample, but honestly strong induction might have uh, made it a little bit clearer if you wanted to, you could avoid the contradiction. I mostly did it that way for the sake of example. But the second half of the argument, the uniqueness, the least counterexample I actually do think is the superior method because how do you show that something is unique? To show that something is unique, you suppose there are two of them and then get a contradiction right? So you, so you prove there's not a second one. So contradiction is very much kind of, it's not required, but it really is an, the probably the best method to show that there's not a second one. You do it by contradiction. You suppose there's a second one. 
okay? So suppose n ha there is a n with two different prime factorizations. Now, because there is an n with two prime factorizations, there has to be a smallest integer, which has the smallest positive integer, which has two factorizations. So we'll take one of them to be p1, p2 up to pr, and another one to be q1, q2 up to qs, okay? Um, R and S are natural numbers. PI and QJ are all prime numbers as I ranges from one to R and as J ranges from one to S, okay? Now notice, on the on the, since N is equal to P1, P2 up to PR, this means that P1 divides N, okay? Now, since P1 divides P1 divides N, that means it also divides the other prime factorization of N. So P1 divides Q1, Q2 up to QS. So if we apply Euclid's lemma, this would mean that P1 divides either Q1 or P1 divides Q2 up to QS. Now we can supply an induction argument here that, well, since this is now a smaller number, it turns out we can get that P1 uh, divides Q1, or P1 divides Q2, or P1 divides Q3, or P1 divides QS. Again, there is an induction argument there, uh, but if you combine Euclid's lemma with induction, you get that P1 divides this product means it divides one of these things, okay? But each of those things are prime numbers, right? Uh, so since P1 divides one of these, without the loss of generality, let's just say it's the first one, because who knows, we could always rearrange the Qs, who cares? Uh, P1 divides Q1, but P1 is a prime, Q1 is a prime. So since P1 is a prime, it's not equal to one. And since Q1 is a prime, it only has two divisors, one and P1. Since it's, since P1 is not, is not equal to one, it actually must be that P1 equals Q1. These two prime numbers were equal to each other. And be aware that this, without the loss of generality, incorporates the reordering of the primes. It's like one of them, it divides. And so we'll, we'll call that one the first one if it wasn't already the first one. So take this equation and divide both sides by P1 because after all, Q1 is equal to P1. You then get that P2 times P3 up to PR is equal to Q2 times Q3 up to QS. Let's call this number M. Now be aware, since we canceled out P1 and P1 was a prime number, M is gonna be smaller than N, okay? So since N was the least counterexample, that means M, since it's smaller, it has a unique factorization. So these factorizations are actually equal to each other. Um, so we get that R is equal to S. They have the same number of prime factors. And up to relabeling, there's this one-to-one -one correspondence between all the primes, okay? And so we'll actually, let's let's say we rearrange it so that P1 is, or P2 is equal to Q2, P3 is equal to uh, Q3, PR is equal to QS, because QS is actually the same thing as QR. And so we have the same factorization. Then if you come back up to N, N is equal to P1 times M. It's also equal to... Q1, which is equal to M, we know that P1 and Q1 are the same thing. M has a unique factorization. So it turns out that these two factorizations are actually the same prime factorization. We get a contradiction. And this thus proves for us the um, fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And we demonstrated this by this method of least counterexample. We could have done it with induction or strong induction. Uh, but honestly, I think the least counterexample works really well in this setting.